Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media. Welcome to program, the exhibition and panel discussion. I would like to ask MP Colin Jordan to please give opening remarks. Good evening to everybody. Welcome to Spike Sound. For those of you who are not from Spike Sound, um, that does not include Dr. Murray. He is, yes, he is relocated to Spike Sound. Um, but it is good to have you in this space and on this occasion. This exhibition and the panel discussion that is about to commence is part of, and we were discussing this just a few minutes ago, part of the legacy outcome from Regathering 2020. During Regathering 2020, we, during Regathering 2020, the Parish Organizing Committee This exhibition and the panel discussion is part of the legacy outcome of our legacy output of the gathering 2020. In February of 2020, we, among other things, hosted a lecture titled From Coffee to Owing. And the basis of that lecture was the continuing struggle of people, black people in particular, for democracy, for the right to determine their own future, and for freedom generally. And the connection that we made then was that in 1675, Kafi attempted to overthrow the system of slavery that existed that colonial period, a barbaric system, attempted to overthrow it and to set up our own government, one that we were the persons who made those determinations as to who would lead us. Kafi was the one who was supposed to make that, um, took to be leader of that, and then the connection through the ages to Mr. Arthur, who was our member of parliament. And we saw that struggle against the United States when it came to the Ship Rider Agreement. Those who are a little older than youngsters will remember that. There was also the struggle against the EU in relation to our tax policy and the ability to have our own tax policy without it being dictated. So that connection was made and we thought that this struggle for freedom ought to be celebrated. Out of that came the publication of the book on coffee and the first New World Freedom Plan. And when we launched the book, Dr. Murray and the Center for Hybrid Studies indicated to us that they wanted to assist us or they wanted to, to, to push this idea of freedom and to push it from Spike Stump. And so after some discussions, and we have with us this evening um, Jackie Arthur Gill, Jacqueline Arthur Gill, the chair of the St. Peter Parish Organizing Committee, and we have the then chair of the Parish Independence Committee, Ms. Cheryl Griffith, and the now chair of the Parish Independence Committee, Greg. Greg Agard Belgrave. And we've come together along with the, or under the guidance really, of the Center for Hybrid Studies. And the Center for Hybrid Studies, led by Dr. Murray, is really in the vanguard of promoting this festival. And so this evening, along with the art, and we will have, Dr. Murray will speak to some of the program a little later, I'm sure. So we'll have different themes for our art exhibitions. And we'll also have various topics for discussion. This evening, a very interesting one. Technology is pervasive, pervasive. It is in everything. 
And so the impact of technology on freedom is not something that we ordinarily think about. But like I said before, this festival, the Spike Stone Global Freedom Festival, is intended to stimulate our minds and cause us to examine concepts that we may not ordinarily be thinking about. It will cause us to, to reflect on who we are and how we are being impacted. I encourage you to view the exhibits, um, including the tech writers and the rotary phones. Some youngsters still, when they see those, try to press to see if that is the way that work reforms used to work. But I encourage you to enjoy the exhibition, but follow closely the discussion and allow your minds to be opened to the concepts that are shared so that we, each of us, can play a part in determining where the country goes. Just like Kafi, Tony, and the other revolutionaries of 1675, each of them, we, we can fast forward to Bassa and Nanny Greg, and the others, we can fast forward to Clement Payne and Israel Lovell and Darn Lee, Darn, I don't remember the surname, but we, we can fast forward and we can, we can recognize that individuals made decisions that influence the future of this country. And each of us has the potential to, by our thinking, to influence where we go as a country. It doesn't take an army or a big crowd, but each of us has the capacity to influence the future. Our own future, the future of our family, our children, but also the future of the country. And so, I welcome you to Spike Stump. I welcome you to this exhibition and panel discussion as part of the Spike Stump Global Freedom Festival. I hope you enjoy it, and I look forward to seeing you at future events. Allow me, before I take my seat, to welcome my colleague, like Dr. Murray, a person who is in Spike Stump just as much as people, other people from St. Peter, but my colleague, my friend, Senator John King, who is very much into culture, heritage, the arts, and again, Senator, friend, colleague, welcome to, welcome to Spike Stone. Enjoy, have a good evening in the North. A very pleasant good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Spike Stone Global Freedom Festival, philosophy and art. And this promises to be an exciting experience as we discover and we explore the subject information and communications technology and freedom. I allow me to, of course, acknowledge Minister Colin Jordan, representative for the parish of St. Peter. And we also thank you for your kind remarks. I'm Antoine Williams. And so this evening, as I said, our panelists will take a look at this particular topic and how information and communication using technology and the sense of freedom has certainly been explored and enjoyed by others, but yet it still remains a provocative and a challenging subject matter. And so this evening, we have gathered individuals who can speak about this topic because of their own experience, both personal and in their private vocations, and who can also give us some insights and for us perhaps challenge us in ways in how we can certainly experience and explore. I also want to join in the acknowledgement and recognition of Senator John King, who is I deem, I deem as a friend of the Spike Stone Global Festival. And I know that he's very involved in this season of emancipation and this festival being a part of the emancipation season. So to all of you, a very special welcome. Allow me now to acknowledge the members of the head table who this evening will be our panelists. I'm recognizing Excellency Martha Ortega 
Corazon, who's the Venezuelan ambassador to Barbados. And she's a specialist in geopolitics as well as government and public policy with advanced degrees in political science and political sociology. She has vast experience in research and education, especially in seeking to understand the economic and social reality of Latin America and the Caribbean. Ambassador Ortega has deep experience and special knowledge about energy security, having spoken and negotiated at the highest level, of course, the international levels, the geopolitical importance of Petra Karim. And this evening, she will address the issue of ownership of intellectual property in relation to digital technology. So please do, do acknowledge and welcome her. And the gentleman who's sitting next to her is her translator, and his name is? Cesar Benedetti. Cesar Benedetti. Benedetti, right. So we acknowledge you. Our next panelist is a certified chief information security officer and a certified data privacy officer who owns the Sun Isle Technology Solutions. He advised the government's Law Review Commission on the technical aspects of the upcoming cybercrime draft bill. He's currently the chairman of the board of management of the LSE School and the past president of the Barbados Information and Communications Technology Association. And he was a regular columnist for the Nation newspaper and the Barbados Advocates Business Monday. Recently, he has provided leadership talks on digital parenting in the age of social media, as well the metaverse and how Barbados can benefit from an early adoption of this new developing space. And we know there's been a lot of discussion as far as the metaverse is concerned. And what exactly is it? And why would Barbados need to be a part of it? So we look forward to hear his contributions. And our next panelist, and yes, Stephen Williams. My apologies, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> our next panelist is an artist and teacher working in theater and digital imaging. He studied drama in education and theater arts at the Edna Manley College in Jamaica and film, video, and new media at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. And he has been curator of art and media at Chicago's historic Hot House Center and youth program coordinator at New York Studio Museum in Harlem. His feature film, A Handful of Dirt, won the 2011 Real World Film Festival Audience Award and was nominated for the Pan-African Film Festival's 2011 Best First Featured Director Award. And he currently, re currently resides in Barbados, teaching photography and video, and operating the multimedia workshop, our studio. Please welcome Russell Watson. <laughs> and so the connection is real. The connection is certainly true. And I would now want to invite Dr. Roxanne Burton, Philosopher, History and Philosophy Department of UWI Cave Hill, to more or less set the tone as to what we are about to experience this evening. I welcome her. Good afternoon, everybody. And all protocols observed, I wish to, first of all, welcome you and thank you for being here. As Mr. Williams said in my introduction, my name is Roxanne Burton. I'm the coordinator for philosophy in the Department of History and Philosophy at the UWI Cave Hill campus. And I am very happy to be here representing the department and the discipline as a partner with the Center for Hybrid Studies. And this is our second official partnership with the Center for Hybrid Studies when Minister Jordan was speaking and he spoke about the We Gathering events in 2020, we have fond memories in the department of the We Gathering events because we actually started a series of philosophy gatherings. And we had an event in this very room. And during those events before the COVID lockdown, um, we had partnered with the Center for Hybrid Studies in hosting those philosophy gatherings. And I am very happy that Dr. Mori and Ms. Aline reached out to us again in terms of the partnering with 
the Center for Hybrid Studies for this series of events on freedom. Now, freedom is a massive issue that we talk about in philosophy. And I just want to highlight a couple of points in talking about freedom. So when Minister Jordan was talking, he was talking about the idea that there is on freedom that we um, that that was started uh, in terms of chattel slavery that was started within this particular um, portion of Barbados, this particular portion of the world. And in talking about freedom within the context of philosophy, we can talk about it in terms of what we refer to as negative freedom. The freedom that comes with not being forced to act in a particular way, not being stopped from doing what one wants to do when one wants to act. And then we can also talk about positive freedom, the freedom to be able to do what one wants to do when one wants to do it. Of course, taking into account how our actions have an impact on other people. And so in the context of the history of this country, the history of the Caribbean region, we are very aware of negative freedom because of the way in which so many of us and our ancestors have been stopped from doing what we wanted to do by virtue of chattel slavery. We don't talk enough sometimes about positive freedom the freedom to be able to do what we want to do. So when Minister Jordan spoke about the ability to make the Barbados' own path in terms of making economic decisions, that is about positive freedom. And when we think about technology and the use of technology, one of the things that we have to think about then is to what extent does technology actually help us to do what it is that we want to do? But we also have to think in terms of what it is that we want to do, what exactly is good for us? And so that raises a whole set of ethical questions, right? And so it's not just a matter of, well, we have the technology, so we should be able to just be free to do whatever we want to do with that technology. But what ought we to do with that technology? And I know that the panelists today will be exploring both aspects as it relates to technology. How is it that technology inhibits our freedom? But also, how is it that technology can help us to actually assert our freedom, the freedom that we should all have as human beings, and the freedom that we should be able to act on on a, on a daily basis. And so uh, with those comments, I want to again say thank you to Dr. Murray and to Chase for, help, for, for asking us once again to partner with them. Um, and I look forward to hearing the, 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 the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Burton. Certainly set in the tone, and I know that this is, you want to hear from these our panelists, so let's go straight into it. Russell Watson, Stephen Williams, and Ambassador Ortega, you will now explore and share with us your comments, your thoughts on the topic, information and communications, technology, and freedom. Good evening. It's a pleasure to stay here with you. Uh, I will need some help with my in, in, uh, speech today, my remarks, uh, from my colleague, uh, Cesar. But I want to say thank you uh, to the Mr. Murray and my sister Carmelia from the Hybrid Center and that initiative that they have to promote, uh, uh, to talk about the emancipation season here in that uh, Spice Town. Thanks to the Minister uh, uh, Collins. 
uh, to the Senator King and especially to the colleagues in the, in the panel, uh, Ms. Mr. Stephen Williams and Mr. Russell Watson, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, so I, I will need my, the help of my colleague. I, I promise I improve my English for the next year. Como les decía, es un honor estar aquí en la biblioteca de Spice Town atendiendo la gentil invitación que nos ha hecho el Centro de Estudios Híbridos. No se oye. No se oye. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It is an honor for me to be here at the Spice Town Library by the kind invitation of the Center for Hybrid Studies. Y el equipo que lo dirige, el doctor Murray y mi hermana Carmelia. Saludo también al, al señor uh, Mr. Steven William y, Ru y Russell Watson. En honor, es un honor compartir con ustedes en este panel. Ya eso lo había dicho. And the team that directs, that directs it, the Center for Hybrid Studies, Dr. Murray and my sister Camilia. I also greet Mr. Steven William and Mr. Russell Watson. It is an honor for me to share with you in this panel. Okay, nos encontramos en esta actividad como parte del extenso e interesante programa que se ha realizado, que ha realizado el Centro de Estudios Híbridos en la temporada de emancipación. Y lo hacemos cuando Barbados inicia su tránsito como república. We are here as, as part of the extensive and interesting Global Freedom Festival program prepared by the Center of Hy for Hybrid Studies as part of the emancipation season, and uh, we do so as Barbados begin this journey as a republic. La descolonización no pasa inadvertida jamás, dijo Fran Fanon en su libro Los Condenados de la Tierra, que este proceso se realice bajo el liderazgo de mujeres, dice, dice mucho de este país y de los tiempos en los que estamos viviendo. Decolonization never goes unnoticed, say Fran Fanon in his book The Demo of the Earth. That this process is being carried on uh, is being carried out under the leadership of women said a lot about this country and the times we're living in. La importancia de Barbados es y ha sido indiscutible, ni, ni su dimensión geográfica ni la cantidad de su población dan cuenta de los aportes que Barbados para, de, de Barbados para el surgimiento del capitalismo, pero tampoco de sus aportes para alcanzar la emancipación y la descolonización en este siglo XXI, tarea que todavía nos, en la que todavía nos encontramos los pueblos del mundo. The importance of Barbados and uh, is and have been indisputable. Neither its geographical dimension nor the number of its population account for the contribution of Barbados to the emergence of capitalism, but neither of its contribution to achieve emancipation and decolonization in this 21st century. A task in which we still find ourselves the free people of the world. Juan Bosch, quien fue presidente de República Dominicana y un reconocido historiador y educador, a través de, quien, de quienes muchos latinoamericanos y caribeños conocimos al Caribe, dijo que en uno de sus libros, Barbados fue una fortaleza en el Caribe avanzada en el Atlántico, cuyo control dio a Inglaterra ventajas estratégicas para mantener sus posiciones en el Caribe. En 1627, Henry Powell llegó a su territorio para establecer un dominio colonial, basado en el sistema de plantación y la esclavitud, primero de 32 indígenas arahuacos llevados por los ingleses desde Guyana y luego con la trata negrera desde nuestra madre África. Juan Bosch, who was president of the Dominican Republic and renowned historian and educator, throughout whom many of us in Latin America fear God 
first got to know the Caribbean, said in one of in one of his book books that Barbados was a fortress in the Caribbean outpost in the Atlantic, whose control gave England a strategic advantage to maintain its position in the Caribbean. In 1627, Henry Powell arrived to this territory to establish a colonial rule based on the plantation system and slavery. First of uh, 32 Arawats uh, Indians brought by the English from Guyana and then with the slave trade from, the, from our, our mother Africa. Barbados fue la primera colonia que adoptó el sistema de cultivo de azúcar a gran escala, haciendo uso de la mano de obra de gran cantidad de esclavos africanos. Por mucho tiempo fue la primera productora de azúcar del Imperio Británico. Desde Barbados, este imperio construyó el modelo legal del Nuevo Mundo sobre, sobre el manejo de, de esclavos. Fue la primera colonia de la región del Caribe anglófono en producir legislación para la regulación y control de la esclavitud, de la barbarie que esto significó para tantos hombres y mujeres. Barbados was the first colony to adopt the system of larger scale sugar cultivation, making use of the labor of a large number of African enslaved. And for a long time, it was the first sugar producer of the British Empire. Barbados was the first colony in the English-speaking Caribbean region to produce legislation for the regulation and control of slavery, of the barbarism that this man for so many men and women. Sabemos la importancia que tuvo el Caribe en el nacimiento del capitalismo. Como bien lo explicó Eric William en su libro Capitalismo y Esclavitud, publicado en 1944. No es exagerado decir que la explotación y la dominación del Caribe fue la base material del surgimiento del capitalismo, el mismo sistema capitalista que hoy pone en riesgo la existencia, de, la existencia del mundo con el calentamiento global. We know how important the Caribbean was in the birth of capitalism. As Eric Williams explained in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, published in 1944, it is not exaggeration to say that the exploitation and domination of the Caribbean was the material basis for the emergences of capitalism. The same capitalist, capitalist system that today threatens its still is existing with global warming. Sin el comercio de esclavos, el Imperio Británico jamás hubiera sido imperio. La acumulación de su riqueza está originada en el sistema de plantación y en la esclavización de seres humanos, a quienes se les despojó de alma, de familia y de vida. Esta explotación sistemática de los esclavos sobre los cimientos de la esclavización, estamos hablando de toda una estructura internacional, el comercio transatlántico, las rutas comerciales entre Europa, América Latina y el Caribe, el surgimiento de los bancos, de los bancos las aseguradoras que iniciaron su funcionamiento para asegurar lo que entonces era la carga más valiosa, la propiedad más valiosa, los esclavos. Without the slave trade, the British Empire would never have been an empire. The accumulation of its wealth is originated in the plantation system and the enslavement of human beings who were stripped, uh, stripped from their, of their souls, their families, their life. This systematic exploitation of slaves on the foundation of the enslavement we are talking about the whole international structure, the transatlantic trade, the trade routes between Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean, the, the emergence of banks, insurance companies that begin to operate to insure what was then the cargo, the most valuable property, the slave. 
Conmemorar la emancipación nos obliga a analizar y hacer algunas preguntas sobre lo eh, que nos demanda re recordar ese pasado de dolor y de esclavitud. Eh, y, de cómo, y de quiénes lo parecieron y de quiénes se encargaron de que funcionara como un sistema eficiente. Quienes se beneficiaron de él y quienes lo sufrieron. Hay quienes dicen que insistir en el pasado no nos deja avanzar. Se preguntan hasta cuándo vamos a seguir hablando de la trata negrera, de la esclavitud, de la tortura. Tanto insistir en el dolor no nos deja mirar al futuro, lo que debemos construir. Sin embargo, si desconocemos nuestra historia, nuestro origen, construimos un futuro sobre cimientos falsos. Commemorating emancipation forces us to analyze and ask ourselves some questions, but about all it demands us to remember the past of slavery and pain, those who suffer it and those who ensure that it function as an efficient system, those who benefit from it and those who suffer from it. There are those who say that insisting on that past does not allow us to move forward. They wonder how long we are going to keep talking about the slave trade, slavery, torture, foolish, foolishly insisting on pain does not, does not allow us to look to the future. What we must, what we must build. However, if we don't know our, our history, our origins, we build a future on false foundations. Okay, that I, I thought about the history and the heritage, because we we know and we uh, to talk about technology, we have to know what the actors in the technologies meanings, because when we talk, uh, for example, in, in the case of Venezuela, we I I talk about the insurance and the possibility to asegurar la carga, César? To ensure the cargo. Uh, about the blockade, uh, blockade with ve against Venezuela, we, we can do that. And the business, las mismas empresas, uh, the same business that uh, begin the uh, insurance, the slaveries, is now the people that told to the Venezuelan industry oil, for example, that we can ensure our, 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 our career. So it's, uh, and it's the same with the owner um, of the technology, because who is the owner of the technology? For example, the, the vaccine for COVID, uh, who is the owner of that? And if we want to talk about freedom, we have, we, uh, we have to answer about who is the owner of the possibility of uh, new technologies, not only the phones, because uh, as the minister said, uh, every, everybody has a phone and it is technologies. And uh, of course, the technology improve uh, our life is uh, the internet is a, a revolutionary uh, mechanism to, to be in, in, and to connect everybody in the work. Last time in this, in this uh, library, we connect with the, prof uh, uh, with the teacher Hillary, and he is in Jamaica. And we can talk with him and, and about some items and the technology makes that possible. But there are some things that we have to ask. For example, in, in energy, energy. Uh, Barbados is improving chance on, uh, on energies, and that, that is a very interesting action. Uh, it's similar that Spain d did 10 or 20 years ago, for example, for solar energy. And who is the owner of the solar energy? In the future, if all the country decide to use solar energy and, uh, and, uh, and they, 
the country can't pay about the the la propiedad intelectual de la the intellectual pro property of that what could happen for example no uh, i i talk I, i can talk about the example of venezuela for example uh, for the subway uh, venezuelan subway we, we buy uh, buy bought a uh, technology from spain after the sanctions the the, the blockade the the business the the owner of the technology decide don't provide any more to equip them to they decide don't uh, do, no cumplir más sus contratos no not to honor their contract with us about maintenance parts all of that so venezuelan engineer and Venezuelan team decide to work in that to solve the problems of the subway. And it's, this is only an example, because it's the same for uh, uh, public service, and electricity, water, and other service that we need some kind of technology to uh, send water to each house, for example. No? And They decide, the Venezuelan engineer decide to work in, in solve the problem that we have when the technology and, and with the issues that we have in Venezuela. After that, that uh, empresa, uh, business, yeah, that, company. The, that company decide to demand Venezuela because we don't respect the, the intellectual proper, property. But they they can answer about the the they the honor they didn't honor the compromise with us, and that's something something that we have to talk about because the technology is not neutral. The technology is even a instrument that we can improve our life, but is even an instrument that that. Um, inside of uh, in, in, incide en, en la forma como pensamos y en la, en la civilización actual. Yeah, it, it gets um, a very important part of how we think and how is the, move, uh, is the world working right now. And especially in the, in the civilization. See, how is the world today? The world today is a world with technology. And we have a connection with the technology and all of the, of all of us have a relation with phones, with internet, with people in other parts of the world. And that's part of our life. But even we that decide how we we can think about the world that we have uh, that we have and the technology is is uh, very important for our life but for f be free we have to know and to ask how much we depend of them who is the owner of that technology who put that information in the web for example no who is the owner of the information and how can our mind both everything that is half in internet and and the the connection and the relation for the phones uh, how that change the quotidian life because sometimes in our families we have everybody at the table with the phone working with other people and how can change our society and how the owners not only of the phone of the technology of the phone the owner of the old facebook twitter instagram put information there that this, we decide that this is right information and this is true or not true of or false no how how can we say that we are free or we live in freedom if we don't uh, 
Uh, that's a word, a difficult word, a difficult word. A difficult word. La capacidad de discernir. La capacidad de discernir está mediada por la tecnología. Yeah, the, the, um, the capacity of making decision to, to have a, an opinion or something is, is, um, is related with the technology. Okay, so uh, when, and the other, the other item about the technology is that the technology uh, improves that we have an individual connection with the, with, the, with the world. And it's difficult to have, f even after two years COVID, have an opportunity to prepare actions together. Because for the, the new technologies, improve only and is, is the, that the, the, the operate, the, um, funcionan, César, fun, operate in that way. Is the relation of each individual with the uh, technology, with the uh, social medias, with everything. And f to be free, w the minister is, uh, was talking about uh, Clement Payne, for example. Uh, we can talk about uh, freedom, uh, about to build a, f a real freedom if we only speak I in an indi individual, in an individual, as individual. We, we need to a colleague and to work together to have freedom. That's w that it was in the past, but is now and would be in the future. And for me, the technology is I, is no. I I don't want that you the, you seeing that I against the technology. No, I I love in technology, but we we have to to be cons conscient to to know that technology uh, is not enough to be free, and the, in the future to be free and to, and to talk about freedom, we need to ask about, about our relation with all the world, and if, if we, are, we are a real freedom, if we live in free, real, reality. Because, as I said, uh, the, the possibility that no construct together and the uh, struggles to have uh, freedom chance in that time, in, in this moment. But we have to know that we have a compromise to continue in that. At the, the, we, are not, we are not free yet. We are, there are an other kind of, of um, domination that we have to, uh, uh, to struggle again, against. So um, I don't want to extend my, my in, in presentation, but I, I especially want that we have to, to ask ourselves and to our and, and to the others, how, imp why will how is it important the technology, but especially who is the owner of the technology? And if, if we have something to do in that, because there are some uh, areas that are very important for the health, for people, uh, I think that the COVID vaccines are a very good example. No, it's a it's a very good example. Or vaccines and technology to have a surgery, to to medicines, to who is the owner? And if we decide don't don't do that, the owners of that technology wants is possible to be free. It's no maybe it's no uh, uh, only an answer. Maybe everybody have a different answers and a different question. 
But my, the principal idea that I want to talk with you is we always have to answer because on my uh, 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 opinion, the owners of the slave and the owners of the banks that, that, uh, and the insurance and the owners of the technology are the same. And uh, the, maybe the slavery is different today than uh, 500 years ago or 300 years ago, but the slavery is a reality and we have to know if we are a slavery or we are a really freedom people. So that's, that's all I want to um, share with you. And as I said, I promise that the next year, if, if you invite me, I will speak better English for you. Thank you. Stephen, if you'll be so kind to offer your comments now. Thank you. Our protocol is established. Uh, it's my great pleasure to always address anyone that could hear me speak. And I do so, I humbly say so because anyone that knows me knows I'm passionate about technology. I'm passionate about my country. I am passionate about us moving forward as a people, us moving forward as a nation that has a lot to offer the world. We are at a stage where I'm conflicted. I've seen progress in the last two years through something that I would have never thought I've seen in my lifetime called COVID. Do you all remember those who can, the debates about working from home and how much it didn't go anywhere? The debates about flexi time. The debates continued about how we're gonna work in a modern era and it went nowhere. And just like that, problem solved. And all it took was a healthcare whip in our back to tell us this is the reality. But we are people that are free. We were free to do it without that whip. We were free to think about all the possibilities of working from home, from another country, Anywhere in the world. I remember we used to go, oh, I'm not in the country, so I can't have that meeting. Zoom! We in there. But we are free. We are free to think about any direction we want to go, and somehow we run back to the plantation called the comfort zone. Because as soon as the Prime Minister declared unofficially, the COVID reality of home is over. We took it upon ourselves, many of us, to run back to the plantation. Run back to what we felt comfortable with, knowing that there are alternatives, there are different ways of doing stuff, but we run back to the comfort zone. And I'm equating the comfort zone to the plantation, because I'm sure, and I wasn't there, that when we were declared a free people, we went off the plantation as hard as possible, fast as possible. But guess what we did? We ran back. But we were free. So are we really free if we keep this rut up? Now, I took the opportunity. I have some points to make, but I just, this is my, just my little intervention, my little rant. Forgive me. Um, to look at the wall, and I hope that those who came in late will get the opportunity to see some of the art of young people today. And I, I got up from this table because I noticed something specific about these two images here. And as soon as I saw them, saw them I knew there was something called NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And I, I, didn't, I didn't, I must admit, if the artist is here, forgive me, but I didn't pay attention to it in a way that I should have because I've been speaking about NFTs, and for those people who, are, who may not be aware of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, it's, new, it's a relatively new digital technology um, 
way of ensuring that artists and content creators get rewarded for their original works. So if we're getting too much of the technology, you can easily copy a graphic to the point where you, can, you cannot distinguish between the copy and the original. But with NFTs, artists stand a chance to get derivative payments well after an individual item is sold. And it's a game changer. And we should, by now, we should have a national forum in culture and the culture industries. How Barbados, in the early stages, because guess what? The power of freedom means that the world is your oyster. You're not limited in, move, in, limited in movement. You're not limited in education. Wherever you want to go, that's what freedom means. But if we stick to our comfort zones, then our jailer is us. And we, don't, we cannot blame massa, and we cannot blame people that don't look like us. We can't start to blame systems. Because I am free to go on any YouTube channel and watch anything to give me the same knowledge as anyone anywhere else. So we, when we look in the mirror, we have become our own slave master. But the things that we do, say, and limit ourselves with. In an internet era, I'm going to switch to my points now. Yeah, because I don't have everything up here. All right. Um, Barbadians are participating in the NFT era. But did it make the news? I hope it does today. I hope you young people that create these NFT tokens get as much exposure as the companies. When I was in my 20s, launched a website, and every newspaper carried this company launched a website. If young people are to progress past just creating art for their own self-pleasure, and we do not acknowledge what contributions they make to the cultural landscape, to the economic development of the country, by creating original works, by creating content that has global implication, we will continue to be our own slave master. But the internet platform is available to anyone to say almost anything. And it is a fine opportunity for young people not just to create NFT tokens, but to tell a story. We are losing our stories of who we are. The stories of your grand, Senator King, men, your grandparents tell you stories about old Barbados. You know that I saw a video, and no offense to any person of any color other than what we have here, right? I saw a video on YouTube talking about tourism back in the 1960s, and how it was. The narrator sounded white because he was in the shop. The plane land, where people got off, where people met them at the airport, Wait, people were in the hotel. Wait, people were on the street selling to them. And for the life of me, I could not tell it was Barbados. And the story of tourism in the 1960s was told by someone else. We are losing ourselves to the same platforms that can lift us up and sustain our culture. By letting other people tell our stories for us, it is a creative platform that we can get who we are out there. And the reason for that is that it's important, is that we need to sell ourselves, no one will sell us for us. If we do not have a philosophical perspective of how we are going to move forward as a country to say 
I will not let anybody else come out here and tell our story for us. Then we'll be holding to whatever they say we are and who we are and we go back to the plantation again because nobody can then deny what it is because we allow them to come here and do it. And guess what? When they do it, guess who has the intellectual property? Is it you, Mr. King? Senator King? No. Mr. Williams? Guess who's now created the intellectual value when we keep inviting people here to tell our stories for us? This is now a movie camera. This is now a digital editing platform. This is now the same platform to deliver the same content. And all we do is consuming TikTok videos and, and, and Facebook content and we're not creating that balance. We're not creating that balance. I consume content too. Agree, we all do. But for those people who have a story to tell, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for that content and the world is too. But we have some stumbling blocks. And I'm here with you guys today to discuss those stumbling blocks because the part of this that I take away is that these forums help to shape the discussion and maybe solve the problems of us coming together, the collective wisdom of all of us. Are we truly free if we keep relying on these platforms and not our own? I remember, I don't know, how many of you remember the Congolese Festival? Remember the Congolese Festival? Oh boy, I got land basically. I said I was on a platform just like this. And I think that I would have run out at high noon. Because I said this. Then Square One, and to less extent Crossfire, was an other artist were running to put all the content of who they are on MySpace. I don't remember MySpace. Good. Where's my space right now? <laughs> Outer space. But guess what? Here's one point of that. We run and give our content to these four platforms that have no interest in monetizing it on our behalf, keeping the content alive on our behalf. But it's owned by foreign interests. They spent a considerable amount of time. Maybe they didn't spend a cent. You said, well, they didn't spend the money. But remember, time is money. Tell me the one thing that when you spend, you cannot get back. Time is the one thing you spend that you cannot get back. And the amount of hours they spent developing pages on my space, where is it now? My argument back then was, instead of running and propping up these foreign platforms, why aren't they getting in the press and saying, where were the young people for us to give our content to? But we, I said, are our own worst enemies. Because if I, Steve Williams, came forward to say, I want to do this, they're going to want to say, what is in it for me? They want their cut. OK, and I said, no problem. Or I would say, no problem. But guess what? Where's the commercial back end for me? The one thing that is seductive that we must be careful of is that these foreign platforms have a very solid infrastructure. Young people with a dream over there gets a backing like nobody's business. And it's not where the government can't. We live in where the government can't. A young person has a dream. Why the government can't? I'm saying, why we all can't? Anytime a young person fails in business, and it was a good idea, tell me he ran it to the ground. But don't tell me he was not supported by our own. Tell me he mismanaged the little funds that he had. But don't tell me you fail to patronize him because you run and give your money to a foreign entity. 
tell me that that young person was not trained as he should be. But don't tell me that you leave your good house, you take up your hard earned dollars and give it to a foreign platform. And I say that to say this, I went on a popular supermarket who transitioned like everyone else during COVID. So have an e-commerce site now, and I congratulate them. And I will not say who they are because what comes next? So I'm just a popular supermarket. When I went down to the bottom of the web page, I saw powered by a company, meaning developed and hosted or whatever, by a company right out the UK. The irony of it is, and I do believe in the stand corrected, that that very owner pontificates deeply on how we should look after our own. So I say, I see a little strange imbalance here. Because when I looked at what was developed, it was nothing that my company, no other company, because I said, I don't have to give me business, because if you feed enough of us, I will eat. But you keep feeding foreign interests when there are those people capable in Barbados to do the work. What is going to happen to our young people? I mean, you say, well, you're like a good, not a good man going overseas. Well, no wonder. No wonder. And it hurts, and it breaks my heart. Because when people come to me ask for a job, it's not like I don't want to give them a job. But when you have situations like that, where what was developed could have been developed here in Barbados, guess what it does? Everybody asks from young people who want a job, what experience do you have? Let me say this. Let's, let's, let's. How many people in here built a home, plan to get a home? I think all of us, yes. How many UK contractors are you going to use? I don't know. Anybody, anybody plan to use a UK, contra UK contractor? But insult my intelligence for going to University of the West Indies, getting the same computer science degree as anyone else, telling me that I am good enough, but when the opportunity arises, give it to somebody else. I will say this, America faced a very serious problem with 9-11. A very serious problem with 9-11. And they had to create new technology quickly. Did they outsource their technology to a foreign company, a country? When they have bombs to make, do they outsource the bombs to China in terms of being made? They know which content, which intellectual property must remain. Must remain. Solar energy, I move on. Are we truly free if we don't believe in ourselves? That's a substantive thing there. Are we truly free if we don't believe in ourselves? If, we take, if it takes a global health crisis for us to just do something that we've been debating forever? Are we truly free if late last year, WhatsApp went down and nobody knew who to communicate with anybody else in Barbados? <laughs> I, I'm laughing, it's true. WhatsApp went down and nobody knew who to communicate Yeah. There are other options. And that's my point. Sometimes we get so comfortable that we can be trapped in that zone waiting for somebody to get us out. We always waiting for foreign aid, foreign help, foreign, foreign, foreign. It is the same thing as Massa. You can make a decision until Massa get home. Or get back from a foreign. It is the same thinking. We can't pivot until we get a study, hire somebody from overseas to tell us what we already know. And then we can study what they said, and then we can get somebody else from overseas to study what they studied and, st and do what they said, 
I'm being beat it to death. And that comes from implementation deficit. Another hanger, hanger, hanger on from the days of colonial past. Because the truth is that we never made decisions for ourselves. We are, we are some called a young democracy. But before we can become that democracy, and I'm going to write, write come home now, sorry. Before we could come, become that democracy, and we say, hey, Barbados is free, yeah, hey, every, you know, Lord, you and Jack can raise the Barbados flag. But all of the thinking still remains, you know. All of the thinking, the only, the major thing that changed on that day was the color of the flag, the look of the flag. But if we still have those archaic institutions, they then become our jailers, our masters. And that's a serious thing. It's a serious indictment when, I don't know if we're going to take another healthcare crisis, to really look at our educational system. Because we educate our people to a very high level, but then ask, then slide to the body that come foreign. Or young people that are educated here, so therefore is something wrong with the quality of our education? Or is something wrong with us? I think we have to take a hard look at both. Are we truly free if we can't distinguish between real news and fake news? All it takes is one body with a very salacious WhatsApp voice note, tongues wagging, and the whole country distracted. Let me tell you how serious that is. If you want to undermine any government in Barbados, it's simple to do. I've always been told the dirtiest thing to do is mix truth with lies. Because you can't distinguish either the two. Because those people who are going to believe in it is going to seek out the truth and say, well, if this is true, the other must be as well. And for those people that are divided, they say, well, this is a lie. But the problem is the truth is in there too. And the minute that you have confusion, Anarchy sets in. So if you want to undermine any government of the day, TikTok, WhatsApp, Snapchat, I have a systematic bombardment of key messages that confuse the population because we have not embarked on a digital literacy campaign. We have spent countless resources, numerous money, millions have got in the billions now, refining the study and the delivery of the English language, and we still count literacy today, but if you could read, spell, or rewrite and spell. That's literacy. But my gosh, we are fighting fake news every day as a people. Because we don't, we have a population that don't know how to navigate this world. And we have a country crippled by not knowing what to do. I guess I'm waiting on some foreign aid to tell us how to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I trust that as you listen to our panelists, uh, that you're making your mental notes or writing, if you will, so that any questions or any comments you would want to offer, we can do so after the final statement or presentation from Russell. So, Russell, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you once again to Derek and Carmelia um, for the work that is ongoing at the Center for Hybrid Studies and for once again including me in your programming. Um, when, whenever the, the 
question of freedom comes up as it did when um, Derek reached out and told me the, the title of this panel. I constantly go back to a line from a song by Mos Def, um, a song that he wrote in response to the Katrina tragedy in New Orleans, New Orleans in the mid noughties And the line is, freedom ain't free. Um, I was fortunate to be invited to talk or participate in a discussion about NFTs during UNCTAD. And to my surprise, I was invited there as an elder. I don't see myself as such, but when I got in the room with the other two artists, I was like, okay, I'll accept it. Um, and they were very enthusiastic about NFTs and the possibilities that were available to them. And I sat there listening to them being an elder artist. And I remember when VHS came on the scene and the promise that it offered for autonomy, for control of distribution. I remember when CDs came in the same conversation. When DVDs came in, it was the same conversation. When streaming came in, it was the same conversation. Um, when MySpace and those kinds of platforms came on, it was the same conversation, the ability to distribute independently. Um, and in every case, what happened is that the industrial structure looked at the technology figured out how to work around the independence that artists were gaining. And in, you know, five, six years, we went back to the normal thing where um, the larger industrial holding companies took control. Um, and there was once again this wide gap between the artists and their audience. So I am enthusiastic about what NFTs offer, but I am as enthusiastic as I was when DVD came in, when mini DV tape came in, when CD came in, when VHS came in, and I see some elders in here, so I would say when vinyl <laughs> came on, right? Um, and I think this is, this is the thing that we should, we should all keep in mind um, with any new technology is that the technology is only as good as the hand that wields it. Um, there's a, there's a very um, often quoted essay um, from the 1930s, um, with, you know, just after, I guess, the real zenith of the Industrial Revolution that talks about um, what that means for art, the ability to mechanize the production of art and to reproduce it. Um, and as many writers at that time, um, kind of, you know, writers of a certain persuasion responded to the Industrial Revolution by suggesting that, you know, machines were inherently evil um, and that we're going to remove the humanity from, from every aspect of life. And certainly there were things, you know, especially with regard to labor that would have um, occurred um, during the Industrial Revolution that changed the way in which we understood ourselves as human beings and as part of a society, is how we contribute. Um, and so this, this writer talked about um, this idea that, you know, reproduction of art um, through mechanical means somehow removes the artist's hand, right? And therefore denatures it and devalues it because of uniqueness is now no longer the thing that defines art, right? Um, and I remember I was, you know, when I read that, when I was at school, I came across that idea and I was like, but weaving, printing, these are ancient art forms. Right? Um, so there is something flawed in this idea, this, this rejection or fear of technology and mechanization. 
So as I look around the room at the work that is here, and um, I see some of my students are, were here. One of my um, colleagues, collaborators, is on the back wall. Um, I am not so much, not so enthusiastic about the possibilities of NFTs in particular, um, because as the cycle that I referenced previous. But what I am really enthusiastic about is the embrace of these new technologies in art making, in our society. Um, and the way in which artists are using these technologies to speak about the reality in which they exist. Um, this word came up earlier, this question of reality. Now, I teach, um, and I am often astonished by the lack of reference that students have. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've remained in the classroom these many years, is that I'm aware that for someone to be able to be critical of the environment in which they live, they have to be able to reference its history. Um, you, I hear sometimes, you know, young artists say things like, well, I'm the first one that did this, and I'm like, no, 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 you are not. But I can't blame them for their ignorance, right? Um, it, is, it is our ability to infuse their consciousness with an awareness of what has happened before them that would give them leverage and wings. So all this said, there are two things in particular that concern me um, in our technologically advanced moment, um, in particular with art making in our country. One is the question of labor. Um, when it comes to arts practice. Um, I actively reject the term cultural, um, what is it, cultural Industry. industries. Um, at least, you know, my, my education led me to a much broader understanding of what culture is. And I try to be, to encourage um, specific attention on art making when I'm having discussions like this. So labor with regard to art making. To the best of my knowledge, um, I am unaware of any structured labor observation with regard to our sector. It's one of the reasons why also I'm apprehensive about using the word industry, because without any sort of clear intentional um, attitude towards the safety and security of the labor force, I don't know that we could say that we have an industry. Um, there are other attitudes towards industry. Certainly there was, a, there was a sugar cane and rum industry in our space that really also didn't look after the well-being of its labor force. And this is why I am so concerned about it, because as this industry gets going, um, it will hunger for a labor force. And if that labor force is not protected by policy, that does not allow entities to come into our country and use our labor force at the whim and fancy of their pockets, or worse yet, to inflate attitudes about income well beyond the capacity of any producer that is operating locally, um, we don't have an industry. So this is one area that concerns me greatly. The other area that concerns me, and I'll end with this, um, is the attitude towards what video and in a larger modality media is. When I finished grad school, I, I stayed out of um, Barbados for a few years and I eventually came home. Um, my education was at a school that was focused more on activist media, um, transgressive media, um, 
it wasn't a, a, a program that was particularly focused on industrial entertainment. And so one of the things that I walked away from that school with was a very clear understanding of, or clear appreciation of the power of media to disrupt. Um, I also walked away from that school um, with a very clear appreciation of media's value in archiving. Um, media as a mode of memory. So when I came home, I was interested in looking at playing my abilities and trade in those arenas. And I went to the usual spaces um, to say, you know, I, I have this education. I'm willing to work. What jobs are available? Is there anything? Um, and I was consistently met with um, a, a, a kind of disinterest in those modalities. I'm happy to say that, you know, 12, 13 years later, that has changed. You know, what is going on at the archive of that digitization project is really a revelation. Um, and in terms of IP, is something that we really need to be very careful of when that stuff becomes digital, right? Um, but it, it was astonishing to me that as, as things were getting going with, with media, with video, photography, the tools were becoming cheaper, more accessible. These um, global distribution platforms were starting to get really, really um, fast. Um, that the focus that we had was on entertainment and a very particular kind of entertainment. Um, an entertainment that did not encourage introspection, um, a type of entertainment that, dare I say, encouraged an, an, a kind of anesthetized experience. Um, and I also saw a kind of lowering of the bar in our journalism community, where just a simple report mm -hmm. was um, enough to call oneself a journalist. And so critical perspective, critical insight um, seemed to be just kind of ratcheting down. And I was like, mm, this is cause for great concern. Um, but I saw this going on in the United States too, where I was at school, right? This kind of lowering of the bar, right? And, and almost a kind of active repression of critical voice in the public arena. So, my concern about where we are now with, with, in particular, imaging technology and activism or the activist voice in our society is not um, anecdotal. I want to read to you one of, the, um, one of the items in our act, our Computer Misuse Act. It's online. You can, oh, there it is. Um, you can read it for yourself, but it is, um, it is number 14, and it says, where a person uses a computer to send a message, letter, electronic communication, or article of any description that one, or a, rather, is indecent and obscene, is or constitutes a threat, or is menacing in character, and he intends to cause or is reckless as to whether he causes annoyance, annoyance, inconvenience, distress, or anxiety to the recipient or to any other person to whom he intends it or, is, or its contents um, to be communicated. If this happens, the person is guilty of an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $10,000 or to imprisonment for a term of up to one year or both. Now, 
I can tell you, I'm on a couple of um, WhatsApp groups. I get annoyed all the time, right? Um, but on a deeper level, what this is suggesting is that any communication that can be perceived as intentionally annoying an individual or an institution can be aggressed by the law in this way. What does this do for the digital activist voice? That's it for me. Thank you. Certainly a, a question that you left us to ponder about. And first of all, I certainly would want to thank our panelists for their kind comments, their challenging, challenging presentations. And uh, you, the audience, will now have a chance to engage them, if you will. Um, if you are doing so, please direct your questions to any of the three, but you can indicate to whom you are directly doing so. All right, thank you for great presentations. It was um, lived up to every expectation that I had. Um, <clears throat> the Center for Hybrid Studies is called, the full name is the Center for Hybrid Studies, um, Caribbean Culture, Science, and Society. And so I thought we did a great job in having science, um, culture, and society represented society in the form of the ambassador, um, science in the form of Stephen, and culture in, um, represented by Russell. Um, so I knew that people usually after the panel discussion, people take a few seconds to get their thoughts together. Uh, so I thought I'd come and ask a question. Um, one of the driving issues, well, a couple of the driving issues that um, caused me to want to start this festival with the idea of technology and freedom. And the first one is the artificial intelligence. We're going headlong into the use of artificial intelligence. Um, as if there is a different, you know, there's a real intelligence and artificial intelligence, but let's say there's an artificial intelligence. Um, it has been demonstrated that the prejudices, the biases, um, the pathologies of the creators are reproduced in the algorithms that run these AIs. Um, so my concern for a country like Barbados, if we are going to be relying completely on other people's AIs, how do we protect ourselves and when do we know that we are actually um, being enslaved? At which point do we know that? That's the first question. Because we know that the example I give all the time is that the, um, the facial recognition AI doesn't recognize women well are black people, people of color, which may be a good thing if you don't want them to recognize you. <laughs> um, uh, but it could also lead to problems with um, misidentity, um, uh, misrepresenting identity and so on. So th that is one issue. And the other issue is the issue that was um, outlined by the ambassador. You know, if we don't I like to use the word curate. If we don't, like the same way we curate an exhibition, we have an aim in mind, and we decide which, you know, what is appropriate for what we want to do. If we don't curate our technological future, how do we protect ourselves from, um, from a situation that happened with WhatsApp where it goes down overnight and nobody can communicate with anybody? Um, I think two days ago, the banks had a problem. You can't use your, um, your card. Um, how do we protect ourselves from these networks that are extremely, we use them every day and think that they're, that they're solid, but they're extremely fragile. And we put serious stock and serious resources, and we depend heavily on these resources. How do we address those uh, specific issues? racial bias in AI and, um, and on the ownership, what's, what's the solution? 
Yeah, it, it, it's not simple. First of all, um, the companies that are advancing the development of AI, first and foremost, they're not a lot. There, there are specific countries that are, there are people who are using it like consumers. So there are people across the world, even Barbados, using different aspects of AI. But what Derek posed was the genesis, that point of which the, the software um, is primed and prepped are ready to be released. What we are taking advantage of, we are still there are different levels of consumerism. You know, people may consume AI to, to make it do what you want, but the core system has to be prepped and developed. And it's that point that he's really talking about, not what we get our hands on, okay? So if you think about it, it really is, you use the word similar conversation, a similar conversation. I could say that about Facebook. We do not create our own, right? We don't create our own. Every time I say, let, and I say, every time I go and say, let's create our own platform, either for communication or creation, people go, but Stephen, what, there's Facebook for that, All right? And I say, well, you know, well, what about, well, there's another, you, you know why I like Russia? I like Russia. They say, uh-uh, not about here. We gotta create our own, deal with it. And what happens is that the people in that country get a level of knowledge and intellectual, prop um, intellectual property and capacity. I like the word anesthetize. Because it's seductive to just use what's there. As opposed to starting from scratch, I'm not saying event fire, the building blocks there. You don't have to start from scratch and say, you know, hit the first letter. But we have to start creating our own. If not, we'll be holding to these systems. It's simple. It's complex and simple at the same time. Because you either want to take what they give you and accept that it is flawed or hope that it doesn't speak to the biases. There's, there's certain biometric biases in these systems, yes. Because the creators of a particular origin. And they, and it, they may not mean anything nefarious by it. But they're going to create images in their own nature. And that's natural. But you're expecting, once again, for these people to do you a solid and do something for we. We go and say, do something for we. Do something. You want these people to do something for we. Why? <laughs> I don't get it. Why? We run and sign agreements for technology transfer. You will go and sign something for technology transfer in exchange of whatever, X or whatever. Let me ask you a question. If I have, I remember, software development IP and coding is more precious than gold right now. Am I going to give you the keys to beat me? Seriously? I'm going to transfer technology knowledge to you so you can turn around and point it back at me? There's only one country that I work with, and, and they have no choice. It's called China. They form all the jobs to China and turn, turn around and point it right back at them. But I think they learned their lesson. So all these technology transfer uh, agreements that we now love to lap up, you're getting the tail end of technology development. They're on to, right now we're talking about 4G, 5G coming in. China has 6G. You know what's interesting? If I want to hear Edwin Yearwood legally, <laughs> I have to go to either Apple Music or Spotify or someplace. If I want to see a piece of art, right, I got to hunt for it. All these works come out of Barbados, yet there's no digital archive of Barbados online that you can license the content. NCF, I make bold, cameras rolling, should be leading the development of a central media archive. 
every piece of digital content created, every piece should be registered and it should cost the artist nothing. But how NCF would make money is that when somebody, a foreign come here, say, I like that, that every chat for something, they go and go through the NCF. And your self becomes a middle person to negotiate that fee. They take a cut. Because there could be nobody, the artist trust, I said trust the NCF, but they're the one organization that stands the best chance. The best chance because they're part of our fabric. They're part of who we are, whether you accept them or not. So how this thing would work, all right? I can break things all simple. It's a website with a big, bloody database behind it. Big, big storage. Every music video, every song track, every piece of digital art. And it doesn't necessarily have to reside there, but you can point to it to show one, the authenticity that is Barbadian, number one. Because a lot of people like to trade off of this is, Bar this is Barbadian. I see cooking shows that out on North America, cooking like a Beijing or something overseas. But geez, on Barbadian, they're using Beijing products, but you may use Beijing products. But the people that are doing the content are Beijing. Every single track, every single image, everything that is created here that can be digital should be registered. And CF doesn't own it, but they say the owner is. So therefore, when some person fly and they see it, they could go to this database and do a quick search. And this belongs to John King. Comes back with all of his works. Either how to contact him or the NCF handles the negotiation. Do you know how much that costs? It costs money. But I'll tell you something. I'll put a price tag on it. 50000 I pull out all this thinner. The difference is, though, when you build content, it expands organically. So therefore, it may cost 50000 a day. It may cost 70 tomorrow and some, something on and on and on and on. But how much money did the NCF spent on an event that ain't even one of the big seven? They ain't even probably paying for the staging. It's priorities. Think about it. Staging a loan for a single event could be $50,000. Staging a loan. So it is a simple question. Do we have the appetite, the true appetite, to bring us along? I say we don't. I say lip service. This is lip service country. We have created the best content, the best thing we've created is lip service. We are masters at it, and we've had all the belts in it. We got from white belt in lip service up to black belt in lip service. We've done a masterful job of lip service. So quick comment and response to um, Derek's question. Um, so the thing about, about AI, as I had said before, is you know, with any of these tools is that it really, and I think this is what you were echoing, is that they really represent the attitudes and ideals of their makers, okay. right? Or their wielders. Um, but I, you know, I kind of think of myself as a, as a backsliding Luddite a little bit, you know, where I, you know, I, I have what I think is reasonable apprehensions about technologies, but at the same time, I am completely fascinated and invested, right? Um, and so one of the things that is happening with cameras um, is that cameras are, have in fact, camera technology has in fact responded to the bias that it initially revealed. So the very first photograph that was m made took eight hours to expose. And it was black and white, and the range of grays that it could see was probably about that wide a spectrum. In a couple years, the time for exposure reduced, the range of grays that it could see got wider, right? So all of a sudden, photography is a public, this new public thing, right? One of the people who took on photography as a life choice, an ideological life choice, was a man named Frederick Douglass. Does everybody know who he is? 
what he recognized about photography is that its ability to represent not just himself, but what he himself represented was unparalleled. He couldn't do it with literature. He couldn't do it with painting. He couldn't do it with song. Photography had that capacity. Now we jump forward a couple decades and color photography comes into the mix, new chemistry, and all of a sudden we have this retraction again of color range. And when you see those early color photographs, you see this huge differential between the capacity to expose white skin and the capacity to expose dark skin. Now, this was something that we just simply accepted. Mm -hmm. My first cinematography teacher told me that when he was learning cinematography, they would put a black person and a white person onto the set, and they would say, right, how do we solve this problem? The problem being the presence of the black person, right? And it was just something that became part of the language of, of, of the discipline. I am not sure that the person sitting on there mixing the chemistry was a rabid racist. True. But there was an issue implicit in the technology that had to be addressed. Now, here's a funny story. That color photography problem only got addressed because of an industrial need. And it didn't have to do with people, right? There was a set of um, lumber uh, manufacturers and chocolate manufacturers who were using Kodak color film for their advertising and catalog material, but they couldn't get true and accurate representations of darker chocolates and darker woods. So they reached out to Kodak and was like, can you all solve this problem for us? And they did. And I see people of a certain generation in here, you all remember Kodak Gold? Yeah. Right? I remember that. When I heard this, this story, I was like, I remember when Kodak Gold hit the market. And I went back to my family albums, and I'm like, there it is. Right? This increased fidelity. Digital comes on. Same thing happens, right? Digital cameras can't see as wide a spectrum as film cameras. Now, where are we? Everybody has technology, as you said, in their pocket with a chip and an algorithm in there that has the capacity to see deeper into the dark than we ever could. So shooting black skin is just not a problem anymore, not in any way that we think about it. But then comes AI facial recognition, and what do we have? Same problem, right? So I come back to this again. I am apprehensive, always apprehensive about saying this particular technology, because what in, in my experience and study, what I see is this cycles. So it's not the particular technology, it's the ideological and in, um, institutional environmental scenario that is creating our problem. Thank you. So this question is from Mr. If I forgot your name, Mr. Williams, is it? Yeah. Yes, Stephen Williams. Um, to go back to your idea to your um, idea for the database, is it possible to achieve complete independence or complete autonomy over a database such as this because from my knowledge something like this like when you have a database or a website it has to be hosted you have to have servers and these servers are not always in the nation where the website is created or where the people that run it exist so I want to know for like a database as you said present as grand as every single digital piece of media that exists from Barbados is it possible to ach achieve complete autonomy or complete independence or something like that to our own hosting on our, on our own servers? And if so, how would you achieve that? The short answer is no, you can never achieve complete autonomy of anything. In any sense, it doesn't even have complete autonomy over certain critical aspects of its economy. All right? They're still heavily dependent on other nations. But what you want to do is retain the intellectual property. Um, I, anyone here have an Apple phone? Apple is very critical to the American economy but it's made in China. 
but the intellectual property of how it functions, so they assemble it, they probably even load the software, but the intellectual property of what makes Apple Apple resides with the Apple Inc. company. So autonomy, you have to know, break it down to ask, what is the value or why we are doing it? We are doing it to catalog and tell our story. We are doing it to ensure that every artist, right, gets their day in the sun. We, we are there to ensure, so how you register someone is to make sure that they exist. It doesn't necessarily have to reside here, but we have to, we have to build that temple to make sure that when people identify that they want Barbadian content or they want to know a Barbadian story, that they know where to go and who the artist is. Because right now we cannot have 300,000 little islands. People who have a content wealth, and let me give an example. See Netflix? Would never take up your movie. Netf I, I tried it, I had a business, and Netflix said one person on two movies don't make a Netflix catalog. Let's be realistic. They want a cadre of content. So no, it doesn't have to reside here. But we have to build a database, you have to build a database. The database have to be physically in one place. Actually, that's a problem mistake too. Because if that, we go down that independent road and the database gets corrupt, guess what happens to the whole entire thing? We want to, we want to decentralize certain aspects of it. But you start with the premise that we're going to catalog everything, every bit of content, and make sure the artists are registered so they come forward and they be seen. We can figure the rest out. Hi, good night. I am um, claiming my, what's the elder term? I'm <laughs> claiming elder. And I just want to go back, way back, in terms of technology. I remember when I was a 10, 11 year old, and I had to write the, my school exams and so on. I was told, you have to write with a fucking pen, because that was the classic way of delivering a message. Meanwhile, that was another technology had just emerged, ballpoint. which we take for granted when we would see it as technology, yeah. which is the ballpoint pen. Mm. <laughs> right? And this ballpoint <laughs> pen was chastigated at school. You could write with a, a, a ballpoint pen. You had to write with a fountain pen. I never had a good script, so I never liked the fountain pen. And I don't want to ramble too much because there's so much things in terms of what the panel discussed and I was just mentioning the whole concept of uh, the danger of a single story. The whole question of telling our story and what is our story and how we identify as our story and then how we use the technology to do these things. And the technology, is, I claim ignorance about technology. I use my Samsung. Just as a side, I have this habit of reading things and want to save them. And I would see this thing say, save the clipboard. I spent the whole of yesterday trying to get the clipboard. <laughs> I have no idea how to get the clipboard. So I have all these lovely things saved, but I can't find them because they're on clipboard. But anyhow, that's an aside. But my, my, my challenge to us as a people, let me give one more story before I finish. Day before on the radio, I heard this BBC. I won't tell me so this is the BBC. I heard they say that Alibaba, everybody knows Alibaba, this big million dollar billion dollar franchise company in China. A man was charged for something. He had the same name as the man Alibaba, and he had the same something as Alibaba. And quick so Alibaba lost billions of dollars. I said, what kind of world are we living in? That on a message that was wrong that your company could lose billions of dollars billions you know so my question here to Stephen and to everybody because your your presentation started with the whole question of the whole question of how 500 years ago were we really free but in today's world we feel free because you could hear about the slap you can 
do all of these things. But what, in all of this, how are we telling our story? How are our stories going to cause us to make money? I'd like your caution about how these things promise so much and what it eventually gives us. How can the artists in Barbados make money? Who do we call artists in Barbados? You know, and that is where I find that this whole question of freedom and technology becomes so important because, final comment, <laughs> because so many things are going through my head as you all were talking, is the whole question of the most important thing for me in life is social relations. And what does that social, what technology does to social relations and how then, how we translate that social relation and as Stephen, Stephen? Stephen keep eluding to all the time. How do we support and build our own by giving challenges to the artist, to the technological person, and all of that? And that's like the richness of what I see as freedom, technology, and culture, and everything else that's going on. Not really a question, but anybody. <laughs> as I said, I'm a backsliding Luddite, right? So I began my creative life in a very organic way. Right, I, or in an organic genre, I used to deal with sculpture. A lot of found object sculpture and a lot of the things I was finding were naturally occurring elements, patterns, and things like that, right? Um, and so when I got into technology, it simply be was because all of a sudden, I was in, in, a, in an environment where the technology was available to me. It was all that happened, right? So I start dealing with this stuff, and I'm, you know, all of a sudden making art on computers like that, right? Um, and I came home now rethinking now myself as an artist in this space, a Caribbean artist, and what defines me as a Caribbean artist. And I go to hear one of the most celebrated designers that this region has produced speak. And he starts talking about the use of detris, materials that I myself was using, right, um, as a defining characteristic of the Caribbean creative imagination. And I was like, I think that is deeply, deeply flawed. Because essentially what he's saying is that our creative, our, our imagination is defined by our predicament. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I started to look at the history of technology, right, um, more specifically. And as I said, this article, this idea of re reproduction and the erasure of spirit, spirit and, 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 and hu humanity from art, um, was where I started. And I discovered that one of the first technologies that really kind of scared people beyond fire was the Gutenberg Press, right? Because what it did is that it undermined centralized power. The church tried to have that guy killed try to retain his IP, right? Take the plans for the Gutenberg Press and hide them away. But the genie was out of the lamp, right? And the press, all of a sudden now, what we understand as information and the flow of information, this magical, evil technology that this guy produced created a, a reality. And we now castigate our young people for sitting on in the phones. True. Right? And I'm like, yeah, but it is not that they're sitting on in the phones that concerns, that should concern us. It is what they're doing on the phones, what they're reading on the phones. Because it, the printed page in and of itself is not the thing. Mm -hmm. It is what is printed on the page that is the thing. Um, the last thing I'll say with you, I, I tried to hold my tongue on it, but I can't because the young man asked a, a very important question about autonomy. Um, I am 
very uncomfortable with the idea of a centralized holding um, space for every single artist and every single piece of mm -hmm. art that comes out of the country. I understand what you're saying, and it gives, it gives, it is a way of giving voice to the voiceless. It's a way of facilitating those who cannot facilitate themselves, but any structure, once again, any technology, mm -hmm. really is going to be defined by the intention of the person who wields it. And so the question would be, what is the intention of that entity that would set up such a, a scenario in a moment where the same NFT technology and blockchain chain technology is allowing us to implement ourselves on the global stage in a way that is unparalleled. You know, I talk about cycles, but I do recognize that where we are right now with this particular technology is, is a pretty giant leap. Um, so I, I am, um, I guess I will go on record and saying, you know, I, I am not enthusiastic about that paradigm. I think there are other ways of thinking about, about creating visibility and searchability for artists in the digital environment that is not about retaining their material in a centralized space. I, I, I want to address that by saying um, it doesn't have to be retained in a centralized space. It could be referenced. You can have a link to it. I mean, if, you, if you're happy being on Apple, be on Apple. We will have a reference to your content from that centralized space, right? Remember, I said I, I am not all for all one location either, because if that collapses, you, technology is not infallible, right? But for those people who can't, remember, I said maybe one artist can't make it on Apple or make it on these platforms that you're begging them to give you visibility, up with visibility again. Part of the problem is, is that unless you're a crossfire, a, a, a square one, or somewhere at that level, or you know, mole, these people that are actually getting international visibility, the small artists might not have that leverage. And for them, putting it on this database might be useful if it's cataloged and logged there. But if you are artists that are comfortable putting it somewhere else, you just have to have a reference to the system so we know what we've produced in the, in the country. There's nothing wrong with saying that Barbados everywhere produces so many hours of consumable content, right? I have links to where the content is. All right? And for those people who want the content logged there because they want a place for it to be housed, can have it there. So it, you, you don't have to be myopic in how you see something, but you have to understand why it needs to be created in the first place. And once you understand why you're creating it, then you could then develop the systems and product policies and protocols to actually ensure that it's not used against those same people that try to have it, you know, have that moment in the sun in the first place. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Mishron Robinson, representing Capital Media 99.3 and Barbados today. Um, this question is actually open to um, anyone that would like to uh, address it. Um, it starts with a comment. It is one thing to say to get up and become owners and producers of tech companies and creators of content. But realistically, a lot of young black Barbadians are still working nine to fives at many hotels and companies owned by the descendants of the colonizers. So I'm asking for suggestions. How do we actively get up to be producers of content and become the owners of tech startups? How can we change that in real terms? Is it the reforming the educational systems? What suggestions would you have for young black Barbadians to become owners and producers of this content, software developers, et cetera? Um, and, and another comment. Elon Musk is looking to have Twitter monetized. Realistically speaking, if black Barbadians had to pay to use Twitter, Instagram, or any social media platforms, many would be left in the dark. What are your suggestions for us becoming creators and owners of digital tech companies? And I know the, Venezuela, the ambassador of Venezuela also hinted at this, um, the concern that we should have about just simply consuming this content. Um, thank you. If you look at the... If you look at the trend, right, of who these people are, right, in the, in the States, Germany, Europe, anywhere in the world, there's not many young people. I'm not saying the older generation can't create too, because it, creation doesn't have an age limit. But you would, tend to, you, you would tend to understand it's when your mind is most fertile and you're not grinding. What we mean by grinding is from the time you have to go get a job, you fall into a system. And money is a trap. 
there's nothing more sexy than saying, you know what? I gotta get up every day, I gotta pay a bill. So I hustling. Why these people like Mark Zuckerberg and then all these people come out of uni university, is that's when you don't have, you're not hamstrung with the fact you have to pay a bill, like you have to meet your rent. So these guys are at college and they're just shooting the breeze, right, of you know, what would be and what's possible. That age of, the, the best way to have that fertile launch pad is between the front of the year to meet the, the last couple of years of um, secondary school uh, up to university. Those years are the development years, all right? And the fact that we don't teach entrepreneurship in, 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 as a CXC subject is a big mistake because if you're a doctor, you're, on, you're, you're a business owner. If you are an architect, you're a business owner. And we don't teach certain aspects of business in school as a separate subject when the whole economy is run on business, all right? It's ridiculous. All right, so we have, a, we have a time between 14 years and maybe 20, you read about 22? The average you read about maybe 22. Those are the development years. What we have to do is, ins is ensure that we have the right stimuli, okay, and it comes down to, and I'm not talking about changing the curriculum, but I'm talking about having certain critical after school programs that lend itself to those fertile minds actually you know, becoming energized. No, it wouldn't solve the problem that we have because we have another problem of investment. But this is where I thought that the concept of GoFundMe would get, Bar get Barbados excited about investing in young people. Because if I said, and I had, and I had a, a business they called SparkNet, what SparkNet would have been is that a young person or older person, I don't care, any person have a good idea, would actually come and pose it on SparkNet. You say what your idea is about, you make your pitch, and then let the Barbadian public say, I'm gonna contribute $500 for that. And for that, they may get a t-shirt to use the Kickstarter kind of, it's kind of like Kickstarter, but the difference is, it's one of our own, and then we set our own stipulations for it, on it, because there may be certain things that are specific to Barbados that you have to put into the platform in terms of how you use FundMe accounts. And I think that's part of the financial uh, uh, regulation that how you collect money like that. All right, you're not, uh, uh, you're not a shareholder, you're not this, you're not that. Can you legally collect money that way? So it's still some regulatory things that have to go into it, especially if people are giving them money. So you have to look at the tangible way that it would work. But the, the, the fact remains that you have between 13, 14 to 24, 22, 24, where young people are the most fertile and the most, ide I guess, idealistic. And once again, to the world of work, that is, that's beat out of them. Because they go, they work, they do a job, they, get, they grind, they get a check, they have bills to pay. And then that, for, that fertile mind goes to the way of how, can I, how can I go and work this fertile mind on behalf of a business owner, all right? They change their energy into how can I make a business owner successful? And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't capture those young people at that stage with that possibility, that ideology in terms of their thinking, in terms of how we can make things different, then you're gonna just see us as a hamster wheel going on round and round. As we bring closure to this evening's panel discussion, allow me to say a special thank you to our panelists. And Russell Watson, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that you've given some riveting thoughts and so certainly set the platform for the other panel discussions which will be hosted throughout the season. I also want to thank the Centre for Hybrid Studies, for it's, it's them who've, been, who've created this as a capital idea. And I know that you will all be looking forward to the next set of panel discussions. As we speak and as we look around, you recognize the art. And allow me to also recognize and acknowledge the creator, Evans McDonnell. Yes. <laughs> this exhibition will be mounted for three weeks. And so please, if you want to speak to Evans, you can do so, get some information. But more importantly, support the artists by purchasing copies, purchasing the work that you're seeing here. That is very important. Of course, those who are also joining us on Zoom, you two are not left out in no way. To you, the members of the audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your kind participation.